I'm playing Alone in the Dark. Alone in the Dark, released in 2008, is a reboot of the iconic franchise. This is another one of those games I was actually looking forward to playing, because I had played the original Alone in the Dark, and I played that when I was like... seven. But I never really forgot about how much of an impact it had on me as a gamer, or on the gaming industry as a whole. The original game came out in 1992 for MS-DOS, and it immediately got recognition for being something completely different. It used a series of fixed camera angles for a cinematic approach, emphasized running from battles instead of killing everything, and had a series of puzzles mixed with a lot of instant death traps. You're seeing this right. Alone in the Dark did the whole survival horror thing four years before Resident Evil ever did. The main plotline takes place in 1924 and follows Edward Carnby, a private investigator, who is checking out the Hartwood Mansion, whose owner suddenly hung himself. Carnby is sent in to figure out why. The original game had fantastic atmosphere, an interesting story, and the survival gameplay was a stellar new frontier not seen before in gaming. The reason I'm telling you all of this is because I want you to understand the kind of legacy that Alone in the Dark has, and how this game shattered that in one fell swoop. The game takes place in New York City, the year 2008, and starts off with the main character groggily waking up. He can faintly overhear a few men talking, and we learn about our first new gaming mechanic. Blinking! When your vision is blurry, you can click the right stick to blink and clear your vision. The whole blinking thing really isn't used that often, and hardly matters until towards the end of the game. The men in the room, who are clearly bad guys, talk about how they're finally going to reach the path of light, and that they need the old guy to manipulate the stone. So they start escorting the main character to the roof so they can kill him. Until this happens. Stumbling through the hallways, our hero then finds a mirror. And it turns out he has amnesia. That's convenient. Sneaking his way to the top of an elevator, he overhears the same bad guy saying that they need the old man and the stone together to become the light bringer. The old guy says they're crazy and evil until the most fearsome of all monsters attack. Cracks! You know what they say? Don't step on a crack or you'll break yourself into oblivion. Something like that. Then the elevator rope breaks, dropping the carriage several stories, presumably killing both of them. Now is the time the game starts introducing how the basic game is played. It's played in a third person behind the back perspective. Huh. Looks familiar, doesn't it? Alone in the Dark made survival horror, then Resident Evil copied it, and now Alone in the Dark is copying Resident Evil. This would be a perfect time to improve upon Resident Evil 4, but they did it worse. Alone in the Dark has somewhat similar tank-like controls, but moving the stick left or right causes you to turn in the direction and move that way at the same time. Now this could be a better control scheme if it didn't work against another major part of the game. Platforming. For whatever reason, this survival horror game has plentiful amounts of jumping and climbing and it's difficult to line up a precise jump when turning left or right also moves your whole character, especially when the game keeps changing back to a fixed camera perspective. It all feels sluggish. It honestly would have been better to exactly copy Resident Evil 4's tank-like turning. Well, it turns out they did. The moment you pick up a melee weapon, now you're suddenly using movement controls that you'd expect. It seems like such a minor thing, but constantly switching between these two movement styles can really throw you off. Think of it like using a lawnmower only you can suddenly strafe. But that's not the only control scheme. You can also switch to a first person view. This actually can make some of the exploration a bit easier, but using, let's say, a gun, which is 80% of the game's combat, is so cumbersomely slow that it's beyond frustrating. So that's three control schemes that you constantly switch between, and trust me, by the end of it all, you'll end up with a case of control schizophrenia. A sloth wearing oven mitts would have less problems knitting a sweater I'll tell you what though, the first person view works really well for EXTREME FIRE EXTINGUISHING ACTION! YEAH! SUCK ON THAT FIRE! And it's a good thing this works fine, because there is a lot of extinguishing going on in this game. It seriously puts Detroit firefighters to shame. 
In all seriousness though, one of the cooler parts of Alone in the Dark is the use of fire. It's a driving motif in a lot of puzzles, making you burn objects to move on or light things up to use as a torch. It also actually looks really good and spreads around to different objects. Enemies aren't fully destroyed until they're burned too, so fire is everywhere in this game. I like it! I feel like if they did a lot more with it, it could be even more impressive. Some more stupid platforming later, our hero comes across this lady. Who are you? What have you done to her? She's one of my hosts now, as you once were. You, my most perfect puppet. And then credits? Wait, what? Oh, that's right. Alone in the Dark also tried to boast innovation by having the presentation of a television show on DVD. Previously, on Alone in the Dark. You can fast forward and skip ahead to different portions, and the whole thing is presented in episodic format. Poorly. I'm sure what they thought was actually great cliffhangers actually interrupt the flow of the story and the cutscenes. It made it harder to follow, if anything else. There's no natural arcs or pacing. I'm really glad this never caught on. Also, am I the only one that finds the demon voice to be the most generic thing ever? You forgot, but not to worry. I still have the keys to your mind. It doesn't help the absolutely terrible dialogue. Now give me my stone. I don't have your stone, and f you anyway. Wow, well, our hero's a real winner. And then they fight! And by fight, I mean awkwardly flail at each other. You use the right analog stick for melee attacks by moving it to one side and then quickly swinging to the other. Which means awkward flailing. None of the attacks are precise and frequently go in directions you don't want them to. Button presses would have sufficed just fine here, like from Silent Hill. It feels like the developers tried to force in innovation where it wasn't needed. Kinda like motion controls. The same awkward melee swinging is used to bust open doors with heavy objects. It's actually kind of a cool idea, but the weak thrusts and wimpy sound effects lack impact. Inside of this elevator, we find the female lead, Sarah, and she's just as charming as our main hero. You're not a cop, are you? Your guess is as good as mine. I don't actually remember anything prior to waking up this evening. Great! My rescuer is more f***ed up than I am! You know, for as weird as the melee attacks are, it sure does look hilarious when moving bodies. You put the dead body in, you pull the dead body out, you put the dead body in, and you burn it all about. A couple of fights and more fire extinguishing later, the two end up in the parking garage where the old guy, Paddington, miraculously survived falling in an elevator. He explains that the main villain, Crowley, is after the stone around his neck, and he somehow knows our hero. The three get into a car to escape, but all of the fishers literally chase them through the streets to get back the stone. And this is easily the worst part in the game. The driving section. The driving controls, this is the fourth control scheme, by the way, are floatier than a hot air balloon in space. Turning any corner causes the back end to wildly swing out. Hitting the slightest bump slams the car to an immediate halt, which equals death. The whole section only takes about two minutes to get through, but it's so broken that it took me over 20 minutes to actually get past it. And towards the end, you drive up the steps in the toppled building and jump out a window, which made me fall through the world. This happened four times. And when it finally did work, it- Oh my god, there is no world here! Oh, there we go. Climbing out of the wreckage, Paddington tells them that he's the world's only salvation and hands over the stone. He says he must travel the path of light and to meet Paddington at the museum in room 943. And then he shoots himself. What the f***? Indeed. Turns out the hero has a really bad cut and will bleed to death if it isn't taken care of which is another game mechanic. If you get a seriously bad injury, you have to find bandages and wrap it up, or you'll bleed out and die in seven minutes. Which is okay in theory, but it happens very infrequently. As such, you'll never have bandages on hand, and they're difficult to find. So when you do get an injury, you're boned. Speaking of injuries, your health is displayed as wounds all over your body. Again, good idea on paper, but not in its execution. First off, this doesn't tell me how hurt I am. I only know I'm close to death when the game switches to grayscale. Second, it just looks bad. Rather than adjusting the character model or the textures, they literally put patches of hurt skin on top of it. And it's painfully obvious, as it looks like chunk of flesh is hanging out on top of the jacket or pants. In fact, in some cutscenes, they literally hang off the character model. So to heal his injuries, we need to get to an ambulance, where we are greeted to another game feature. Open World Exploration in all of Central Park. And I use the word exploration loosely because there's nothing to find! The whole park is barren! 
No secrets, no extra weapons or hidden items. It's just a thing because... It's a thing that other games do. There's only one real reason for it. And I'll get to that later. I get to the spot where the ambulance is supposed to be, and it thankfully pops into existence. There, a doctor patches him up, and he starts to remember a little about his past. Full name, please? Edward... Carnby. Ah, that's cool. That's a nice little nod to the original games. But wait a second. Researcher. Paranormal investigator. Huh? Saw the case of Jeremy Hartwood's suicide at Tercito's Manor in... 1924. Disappeared under strange circumstances in 1938. What? No! No, no, no! Fine, I'll accept that Edward Carnby is still alive through magic or whatever, but I will not accept that Edward Carnby, the relatable, down-on-his-luck private investigator, became this unlikable asshole. Don't fuck around or I'll shoot you myself. Edward's never had a scar! They don't even look remotely alike! And if he disappeared in 1938, that completely ignores what he did in Alone in the Dark The New Nightmare. Which was already anachronistic, because that game takes place 75 years after Alone in the Dark 3! And then there's another driving section! With bats! And the first one was already bad enough, but this one is somehow worse. The bats slowly rip the car apart, so if you mess up, they'll kill you. And it's hard to not mess up when driving along the pathway causes the car to inexplicably jump! And if that wasn't enough stupid, Reaching the end causes the bats to lift the car into the air, and then toss it into a fountain. This is done as a setup for a boss fight against the bat's nest. And the boss fight is pretty easy. You simply throw explosive bottles at the nest and shoot, and then hide from the ensuing bat tornado. And I wish I could have had a better instance to say the words, bat tornado. Edward and Sarah still need to get to the museum, which is separated by a large ravine. So they set up a tow truck to jump the gap, which works about as well as you think. But just before they make the jump, the swarm of bats return and steal Sarah away. And there's no real reason for them to take her other than to set her up as a damsel in distress. And it's really short-lived as you immediately find her inside the museum, inside of this goopy thing. You free Sarah by slapping the thing with an axe and she gets pooped out. And then, CPR gameplay! Damn, dude! I'm no lifeguard, but I think that may be a little too much pressure. Maybe I should take notes though, because apparently fracturing a rib means making her fall in love with you. Running through the instantly changing museum brings up another boss fight. It's another fight we throw flammable bottles at the enemy and then shoot it so it explodes, and then you hide until you can do it again. It's a bit better than the bat tornado at least. Check out this puzzle. In order to destroy the nest spawning spiders, you need to stick an explosive on a spider so it goes back to the nest. This is another decent mechanic of Alone in the Dark. Edward's inventory is entirely in his jacket, and you look down and look at your pockets. You can combine a bunch of items for new effects, like putting flammable liquid on your bullets for fire bullets, or putting a cloth in a bottle to make a Molotov cocktail. There are two problems with this though. One, this isn't a pause, so quickly trying to make more fire bullets in the middle of a fight gets cumbersome and enemies will still attack you. Two, you have very, very limited inventory size. Between picking up bullets or a bandage, I always go with bullets and then I end up bleeding to death. In order to move on, the gate can only be opened by the handprint of the security guards, but all the guards in the museum are dead. Don't worry, I've got just the thing. <laughs> to get to room 943, Edward needs to do a little more elevator shaft rope climbing, which it turns out is harder than you'd think. Inside room 943 is Paddington's secret workshop, and there's actually a pretty cool puzzle here. You need to close your eyes, and Paddington's ghost points to words in the room to tell you what to do next. Which is for Sarah to beat Edward over the head, so that he can talk to Paddington's ghost. Huh. You'd figure a Ouija board would work just fine. Paddington explains that the stone that everyone is fighting over is actually an artifact created by Lucifer which carried his soul and made men immortal. So that Lucifer could pop back out and... I don't know, kill everyone, I guess. There's a couple of more kinda cool light puzzles, which opens up more secret passageways, and leads to clues for Edward to go to the Central Park Castle. Before he can do that, he escapes this underground cavern, thanks to some EXTREME FORKLIFTING ACTION! Back in Central Park, you light up a thing to light up another thing to show you need to go to the castle. Edward can't actually get into the castle, because it's surrounded by a massive shield. The only way past the shield is to increase Edward's spectral vision, which is done by burning evil roots found around the park. And you don't just burn a couple. 
you need to get a total vision rating of 75, and each route gives you about 2-3 to three vision rating. This is known as padding. It serves no other purpose than to artificially extend the length of the game. And the routes are the only reason that the open exploration of Central Park even exists. Both are unnecessary, and the game as a whole would have benefited greatly if it just kept the linear progression. And down, deep inside the castle, Edward finds the secret to ending the whole catastrophe. This guy, his name is Hermes, and Sarah calls Edward to let him know that he's only got a few minutes to get Hermes back to Paddington's secret room. Which means, another driving section. For whatever reason, this one has a time limit, but it's completely superficial because the time keeps increasing as you drive along. I'm sure it was meant to add tension, but I ended up ignoring it completely. Back at the museum, there is one last boss fight, and it's against Crowley, the jerk that's been the cause of all of this. He has taken Sarah hostage, and threatens to kill her unless Edward hands over the stone. Edward is put into a tight situation, and unless he- <laughs> Or that works! Hermes uses his self to open up another secret passage, which goes to a large portal-like thing. There, Hermes puts his half of the stone down, and instructs Edward to do the same. This allows Lucifer to return to the stone, and Edward takes it to do a soul battle with him. But then Sarah says he doesn't have to do it alone, and then grabs the stone. Lucifer starts taking over her soul, and then collapses to the ground. Edward embraces her, and she asks if he loves her. He says yes, and then this happens. What will you do now? Kill me? How does it feel to be so alone? I'm used to it. That's the good ending. I actually prefer the bad ending, because you get to do this. You're not a man anymore. I'm the light bringer. I'm the f***ing universe. Did you think I'd come alone? And just like the rest of the game, the endings leave a lot to be desired. There is a lot to this game. Like, too much. That's why my final rating for this game is too much candy out of 10. There's actually a lot of potential throughout all of Alone in the Dark. They had a lot of good ideas, and a lot of different ideas. In fact, they had too many. The developers tried to put in so many things that the whole project suffered. I like the use of fire, the item combination is cool, some of the puzzles are neat, and the soundtrack is pretty good. But the open world, patch-like injuries, evil roots, and multiple endings were all unnecessary. Plus, there are zero horror elements in this game. All Alone in the Dark needed was someone at some point to say, Stop! That's enough! Let's work with what we have and make that really good. This could have been a great game if they just had focus. They also needed about 80 more bug testers. Oh hey, you're still here! Is that because you liked the video? Well if that's the case, maybe you should press the subscribe button so you can get more videos in the future. Or, since you've clearly got some free time, why not watch some more? There's the secret island of Dr. Kwanji right over there. Give that one a nice little recommendation. You can watch that whenever you want, really. Or right over here, we got something a little different. It's a one minute review of the XCOM game that just came out. So, you know, you can click on either one of these if you're so inclined. Or you can go away. But don't forget about me. I won't forget about you.